Welcome, everyone. We're delighted to have you all here. Uh, my name is Michael Hoden. I'm a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and ex executive director of the Coalition on Global Aging. Uh, but more importantly, thank you. Just, just testing. <laughs> uh, truly delighted and honored to be here to help introduce our lecture this evening. And before I introduce Dr. Joe Ivy Buford, whom we also want to thank very much for hosting us in this wonderful uh, setting. Uh, it's, I love the idea that we're here in the library. Um, I want to spend a moment to uh, note and thank uh, two different people. Firstly, uh, Noel Latif, president of FPA. Thank you, Noel. These are the kind of lectures that you do, and many of you attend them, and, and we're delighted. And it's another great resource that we have here in New York and around the country as you communicate these lectures. But most important, <laughs> but most importantly, uh, to thank and honor them. Sackler, uh, damn Jillian Sackler. Uh, I had the very great pleasure of, in a minor way, knowing your husband and uh, what you've given to New York, America, the world uh, in your uh, contributions, in your enthusiasm, uh, intellectually, in the world of art, the world of medicine, the world of healthcare. Uh, is truly a gift. And uh, thank you so much, and thank you for sponsoring this lecture. So Dr. Buford will uh, give us a lecture in a moment. And before, I would just like to introduce her. She's currently the president of the New York Academy of Medicine. Professor of Public Service, Health Policy, and Management at the Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service, and Clinical Professor of Pediatrics at NYU. So if you get ill this evening, we're in very good company. Uh, she served as Dean of the Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service at New York University uh, several years ago, back in the late 90s and up till about 02. And prior to that, served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health in Department of HHS. Uh, and I know that Joe has also continued to be uh, providing uh, service to our country and to the world, certainly in the public health arena, and even earlier this year, uh, represented the United States at a very important meeting in Russia uh, on noncommunicable diseases, which uh, we're now moving through the UN process, as it were. Um, at HHS, she served as the US representative to the executive board of the WHO from 94 to 97. I know this resume could go on for a long time, but I don't want to cut into uh, the lecture, which is the reason we're here. So, Dam Sackler, thank you again for br allowing us to have this, for bringing this to us. And Dr. Buford, we welcome you now. Good evening. Um, I'm honored to have been asked to present the Dame Jillian Sackler Lecture, and I congratulate the Foreign Policy Association for its important and excellent programs that are geared to make the public in general and opinion leaders such as yourselves more aware of the importance of a variety of U.S. foreign policy issues. And I'm particularly pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you tonight about health at such a critical time for our national and global health agendas. And I want to thank Noel and uh, Jillian Sackler for the invitation. Um, as in most other areas of public policy, trade, communications, economics, defense, what the U.S. does has significant impact in the world and the area of health policy, um, either domestically um, or globally, is no exception. Um, in fact, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has emphasized placing the concept of soft diplomacy, which is an emphasis on health and science and technology, 
as well as education, especially for girls, um, at the center of U.S. foreign policy, and the U.S. is not alone um, in this emphasis. Um, such an emphasis really builds on an unprecedented period of both political and financial support for global health, which includes the realization that a healthy population is a critical element of successful national economic and social development. And that link had really not been made terribly effectively until about a decade ago. The UN Millennium Development Goals, let me push the right thing, uh, which are familiar to many of you, um, agreed, are agreed targets for international cooperation to reduce poverty, disease, and death. And although only three of the MDGs are specifically health-related reductions in maternal and child mortality rates and infectious diseases, um, the other MDGs on education, poverty alleviation, agriculture are deeply linked to the root causes of death and disability. The recent, okay, sorry. The recent UN review, too much. Okay. All right. The recent UN review of MDG progress showed significant increases in country and donor investments in these areas, but disappointing results in addressing the rather dramatic health disparities among and within countries, and uh, with many of the world's poorest countries actually moving in the wrong direction um, on the desired goals. Um, and the historical patterns, which uh, this approach represents, of international investment and technical assistance focused on specific diseases or specific populations have, have realized enormous successes in actual eradication of some infectious diseases, development of vaccines to prevent others, availability of affordable medicines, especially for HIV AIDS, which really have permitted management um, of uh, infected individuals and inhibited spread, and some targeted reduction of infant and maternal mortality um, and longer life expectancy in many countries. But there is still a real implementation gap between what we know and what we do on the ground, especially in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and that becomes apparent in a table like this. I guess I push this back. Um, this is a chart of uh, life expectancy um, declining in the developing world. You can see the significant declines in um, Sub-Saharan African countries. Haiti's plateaued out. I don't know if that would look exactly the same um, at this point in time in other countries. Uh, Russia is an interesting country because it has had the actually largest decrease in life expectancy among men um, in the last several years, largely related to heart disease and associated um, alcoholism and smoking. So um, it's a, a crisis like this. People who have been looking at these big demographic patterns since uh, post-World War II, some would indicate that um, we have some similar conditions in a number of countries. Um, and the strategy for intervention has largely depended on provision of Western expertise um, from so-called developed countries to diagnose and treat problems um, happening over there, somewhere else. Uh, donor investments in vertical programs actually often were uh, inconsistent with national health goals. Um, President Kagame of Rwanda noted that um, while 80% of his overseas development health budget was um, in HIV, he only had a 4% incidence of HIV in his country. Um, and so the issue of uh, reconciling that um, has resulted in a failure to build capacity um, in the countries to maintain the services and the educational research programs uh, that may be developed, but can they continue when the funding cycle ends? Um, so as a consequence of these current implementation problems um, for global health initiatives, uh, a lot of the reason we haven't reached um, our global health goals have been um, the problem of weak health systems and inadequate numbers of health workers, at, um, as well as local or regional higher education and research enterprise that really cannot generate knowledge grounded in the country itself um, to solve national problems. So quick examples of some of these problems. About five years ago, the Rockefeller Foundation began to look at the adequacy of the health workforce and asked whether, given all the other things one could do on health systems and workforce, did it really make a difference? Um, was the number of health workers related to, um, to uh, survival and or better outcomes? And Sadir Anand and colleagues from Oxford and Harvard did this work, and uh, controlling for effects of income, adult female literacy, and absolute poverty, he did demonstrate at the global level that 
uh, numbers of doctors, nurses, midwives, and pharmacists, which actually are the only ones we can count at the global level, um, do make a difference in the effectiveness of interventions for um, maternal mortality, infant mortality, and under five mortality. The biggest differences are maternal mortality because we're at a point now where technical interventions um, are becoming um, the most important target for the work. Um, not surprisingly, worker density is associated with the GDP, um, which is important to overall health and development in most countries. Um, who have relatively low GDPs, have relatively low number, numbers of health workers. There are some exceptions, um, Russia, Philippines, some of the other countries actually export health workers, so they produce them as an export good, um, and um, have been uh, turning out more. And then worker, de this is uh, disparities uh, by region, they're really huge, and um, it's estimated that 25 health workers per 10,000 population are needed to achieve the MDG health targets I showed you, and obviously of the 46 countries in Africa, few achieve this density, the average is less than 10. Um, so these are, um, and then we see the association, the dark red being low density of health workers and are, are also the areas in which uh, disease rates and burden of disease are highest. So um, with some of this exploration on workforce, uh, donors ha have begun to recognize the shortcomings of um, past models and really begun to try to invest in capacity building as well as in the resource, the results of their product. But um, at the time when these shifts are happening, there are obviously a new set of challenges uh, to human health care arising, health, health, sorry, are arising. And um, these are ones that I would argue are changing the way that we think about global health and how to improve it. So um, in the interest of full disclosure, you may have been lured to this lecture by the word contagion in the title. Um, the recent blockbuster movie has only reinforced the historical emphasis of global health on preventing and controlling infectious diseases um, and uh, preparing us for epidemics like flu or SARS or uh, the risks of bioterrorism like anthrax and sarin gas. Um, and they are still all very important, are getting a good bit of attention and deserve to have that interest sustained. Um, but the new global health challenges are emerging from an alternative definition of the word contagion um, that you can find in the dictionary that refers to the spread of influence. And I think that is a really critical issue in the discussion for tonight because this kind of influence is a fundamental result of globalization. And the model for addressing health problems caused by these contagious influences really has to change. So as uh, global public health expert Kelly Lee explains, globalization is not a new phenomenon. Um, it's been around for hundreds of years. We know the explorers took diseases that wiped out entire populations um, in North and South America back in the 16th and 17th century, and ironically also brought back something that it took a few hundred years to start wiping out um, the sending countries, which is tobacco. Um, but when you think about that exchange issue, it was an early example of the sort of bi-directional nature of, uh, of global health influences. And um, the difference uh, that Professor Lee identifies is the speed of globalization, this breakdown of economic, physical, and temporal boundaries that really enhance the flow of goods and technologies, information and people, and this quickening pace of globalization has also led to the spread of ideas uh, like what constitutes a desirable and affluent lifestyle and where to go to find it, and those are elements of the discussion this evening. So the old pattern of tackling diseases that only occur somewhere else um, and uh, to prevent them from coming here has shifted to focus on diseases um, and conditions of civilization that are both here and there. We all share them and we all uh, need to solve them together. But this is a huge shift in the mindset of uh, traditional uh, development and technical assistance. Um, so in the need to act on broader determinants of health beyond personal health care, um, there are three uh, issues I want to talk about briefly this evening. One is um, the is that are effective globalization. One is the broader determinants of health. Second is urbanization. And the third is aging. Um, and let me take each of these in turn. So what, first of all, what factors have the strongest influence on health? Um, there's increasing evidence that personal health care, the services to individuals to treat diseases, is not the major factor in achieving population health at the national level nor in global health. 
Um, in 2008, 2009, uh, the World Health Organization's Commission on Social Determinants of Health, of Health led by Sir Michael Marmot, presented evidence for um, the importance of environment, education, economic development, and community cohesiveness uh, to health, and the importance of health in economic and social development strategies of countries. Uh, to complement this effort, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation commissioned a similar um, group here in the U.S. and really confirmed the evidence in the U.S. context. Now, the U.S. spends more than any other nation per capita and a large percentage of our GDP on health, and the results of these expenditures are impressive. We clearly have the world's most technologically sophisticated health care system, personal care system, alongside um, a tremendously developed uh, biomedical research system. But the combined effect of this investment in the overall health of the U.S. population has been disappointing. Um, among developed countries, the U.S. currently ranks 22nd in adult life expectancy and 47th in world infant mortality. Um, so why have our investments not resulted in higher levels of health. One reason is this issue of the importance of medical care, which is where most of our resources are invested. This is some work by um, Mike McGinnis and Bill Fagey that estimate that um, for the U.S., uh, less than 10 percent of premature mortality could be um, uh, prevented uh, through better access to health care. Some uh, researchers say that could go as high as 30. Um, but that assumes that all preventive services are in the, the doctor's office. Um, by far the vast majority or these risk factors of tobacco, exercise, diet, and alcohol use, um, many of which are influenced by the communities in which people live. So people who live in communities that don't give them the healthy choices to make in terms of the foods they can eat, whether they can exercise, um, whether uh, they have uh, safe streets, safe parks, and uh, housing. Um, tend to do worse in the behavior area, um, even when they have the information that they need. And then built in natural environment um, is about 20% and genetic factors are another 20. And by contrast, the U.S. investment pattern is most of the 99%, it's now about 97%, are in the personal health care system. So our investments are really out of sync if we want to get better health outcome for our health policy. Now, another way to think about this is some work done by uh, Dave Kindig um, at the University of Wisconsin. He looked at uh, the broader determinants of health. These are county-level data um, on the question of what are the key factors associated with, with mortality or early mortality. And um, he adjusted these by age and sex. So what that means is if there's a lot of old people living in one place, that doesn't count here. And if men and women have different life expectancy, that doesn't count here. And this first map shows um, the red areas are high mortality areas. The dark blue are um, low mortality areas. So um, living in the Northwest is a good thing. Um, living in the South is a little bit of a problem. That triangle on the left is Nevada. That's going to show up in every slide. And as I've presented these in front of health officials from Nevada, they just say, well, we like to smoke and drink and um, you know, gamble and have prostitution. So you know, leave us alone. Um, at any rate, um, the second map adds to age and sex the issue of race and ethnicity. And watch the change in the lower right-hand corner. So we're now con controlling for African-American concentrations in the southern part of the United States, Latino concentrations um, in the Southwest. And um, you can begin to see um, how important the issue of race and ethnic composition is. Um, if you add control for socioeconomic status, poverty, you virtually eliminate many of the disparities in this country, and it speaks again to the kind of analysis that's going on now at the UN on broader determinants of health. And if you superimpose on this the availability of health care, um, you see almost no difference if health care, personal health care is added to this map. So I think this is just a dramatic way to um, try and give you a picture of um, the broader determinants of health in the US and uh, and in global health policy. So to tackle these, we need a new paradigm. And this schematic diagram is just to look across the bottom are different types of interventions starting in the lower left-hand corner, which is medical care, hospitalization, moving out into community-based practices. Then some of the kind of preventive activities like seat belts and helmets and no smoking, 
um, immunization. And then when we go over to this far right area where we start dealing with government policy change on transportation policy, on housing, on education, on economic development, is when we see the biggest impact from individuals to community to society and institutions going from illness to health. So the, the point of this slide and the point of the conceptual framework is if we stay stuck in the personal health care part of um, global health intervention, we miss, and I'm not saying leave it, but we, if we stay there only, we miss the potential for broader impact. And that's essentially the kind of transition that um, is going on now in relation to um, UN activities on non-communicable diseases. Now, such a strategy obviously cannot be done by government alone. This is a diagram from the U.S. Institute of Medicine study a few years ago, which really depicts all the people that have to be involved. You can see the business community, academia, media, um, as well as government need to really align their activities for health in order to make that um, you know, significant change over at this end. Yes? It's conceptual. It's a conceptual graph. Yeah. But the data that I was presenting to you having to do with avoidable mortality from healthcare is data. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this is a schematic to try to give you a sense of how you have to push the envelope out of the personal healthcare space. Um, so, um, why uh, we began to see, I think in the recent um, September, uh, meetings of the UN General Assembly, the high-level meeting at the UN in September. It was um, only the second time that heads of state had asked for a briefing on health issues. The other time was 1988 on HIV-AIDS. And the reason is because in non-communicable diseases and the focus for the conversation were really heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and pulmonary disease um, is the number one killer in the world now. Um, and um, they also are um, the number one, becoming the number one killer in certainly middle, are already in middle income countries, upper middle, and of course in high income countries, and the, the rate of growth in low income countries is increasing um, dramatically. Um, some of the data that was uh, presented in, to the heads of state at the UN meeting really show lost output. This is work um, by the World Economic Forum and um, colleagues at Harvard looking at um, the, the total loss is the yellow at the top, um, and then you can begin to see upper middle income is the red, but um, the, uh, the lower income countries are sort of beginning to get um, that loss of, of, uh, of economic output from the impact. Um, and um, the cumulative economic losses from these diseases, um, as uh, David Bloom has, has presented, um, that I mentioned are over $7 million, uh, $7 trillion um, at current levels of intervention. And this is the equivalent of 4% of the GDP of most of these countries. So it is quite significant. And um, I think it was a wake up call for a lot of people um, seeing this data for the first time. Now, I mentioned global, so let's go back home for a minute. Um, New York City's experience um, with these issues is pretty much the same. So these are um, the, uh, these are the incidents of um, causes of death in New York City. You can see heart disease, cancer, um, pulmonary disease in the second or the third and fifth slot, and diabetes. Um, and New York's experience in tackling these issues um, was a very popular part of, um, of the uh, meetings surrounding the um, high-level forum. The NCD Alliance uh, convened over 200 NGOs here at NIAM. Um, working on these four big killers, and the reason they have a coalition is because the risk factors are the same for all four of these things, diet, exercise, tobacco, and alcohol. Um, so they had an alliance that really stood up, and um, the panel with Commissioner Farley um, was clearly the high point of their meeting during the day. Be why? Because he had he could demonstrate the interventions and the results. So just two examples. This is the challenge I think we all face for tackling this agenda. Um, the, um, this is work they've done on tobacco. You can see um, the, the uh, time frames over the various interventions on tobacco um, control in, um, in New York City, and they can really relate the different interventions to the decrease in the number of smokers and uh, 
This is now down to 14%, which is pretty remarkable, really, for a city like New York. Um, and the prevented deaths is estimated to be half a million um, through these efforts. So um, another nice example of the data and the intervention that they presented is reduced air pollution. These are maps. Um, largely having to do with emissions from fuel oils in buildings as well as cars um, in the winter. And so they've measured these by sensors. You may not notice them, but they're all over the city. Um, and um, have really looked at um, the intervention of controlling new rules for fuel oils. They'll have to, everybody will have to phase out of the old um, sludgy one in the next two years. Um, and start new ones, and they're estimating. Um, and this is the kind of data that healthcare people resonate to because it saves cost of healthcare policy members, and they put it in this form. It's not by accident um, that they can present it. So um, the overall um, result has is, and these are um, active design guidelines, many of whom uh, you have, I know have either been threatened by or seen um, the bicycle lanes, but um, they're very important. And the acts of design guidelines, which were put together by urban planners in New York, are now an, an international model. I was at a meeting in Brazil, and this guidance is everywhere. Um, it's one of the first cities that's ever done this. Um, and this is the result. Uh, New York City's life expectancy is higher than in the United States and has shown an increase in the last number of years with the actions uh, that have been taken, among others. Now. Um, Back to the UN for a moment, the declaration that was passed um, by the heads of state, 82 countries and 35 heads of state, um, really brought attention to the importance of what I might call governance, of bringing together um, the, that the political leadership in a country or in a region or at a city level really has to be involved because they have to bring together agencies from different parts of the government as well as nonprofits, that bubble diagram that you saw. And many people won't come to a meeting unless the boss tells them to come. So um, this is a kind of different notion and it clearly um, can't farm this out um, to uh, a minister of health. And this is kind of called health in all policies and you can see um, this uh, notion of intersectoral action in the health plan and um, a lot of European countries have done a lot of work on this, um, and uh, the approach really um, invites just, uh, um, segments of government as well as non-government to look at the health impact of decisions that are being made anyway on what they're doing. So as an example, um, if you're exporting tobacco to low-income countries because you have bans in your own country, obviously there's a bit of a tension there between economic return and the impact on the receiving country in terms of smoking and death. Um, really interesting example of World Bank investment, um, big transportation programs, Bogota, Colombia, really focusing on mass transit, bicycling, pedestrian activity, um, Karachi, Pakistan, twice as much money, only building ring roads and flyovers in the city, which of course increases the utilization of cars, pollution and others. So these were clearly um, loans given by the bank that could have been, um, uh, might have been different if the health lens had been in place. Um, the Obama administration um, calls this health and all policies approach place-based strategy, and they've been doing this since actually the second year of the administration. Um, in this instance, multiple agencies, um, HUD, EPA, and Department of Transportation um, are the first ones um, that have joined together on programs, including mixing funding streams, which if you've ever been in the federal government, you know is just um, anathema. It's amazing that they've done this, and everybody's really excited about it. Um, and the focus is to do joint programming in a geographic community. And New York State received seven of these so-called sustainable community grants. Um, and the Health Care Reform Act also creates uh, a national commission on public health prevention an integrative medicine, which really um, brings together 17 federal agencies chaired by the Department of HHS and um, who are charged with developing a national prevention agenda and trying to coordinate better the activities across these agencies to get um, to health. And so you can see that this approach is really fundamental to what Mayor Bloomberg has been doing um, in transportation, education, um, environment, and others. So, so this brings me to the, the next two factors. One is the issue of urbanization. So in addition to the spread of non-communicable diseases, the growth of cities 
is a major global phenomenon. We talked about the contagion of the ideas of the kind of lifestyle you want and in where the opportunities are, and most people believe they're in cities. Um, and so the question is why, um, why does this really matter? Um, the answer is the majority of the world's population is in cities. Um, that crossover turned in 2007. Um, there are major disparities in uh, low and high income countries. Much of the growth is rapid, unplanned, res resorting in slums and informal settlements in very large megacities in Africa uh, with really um, outpacing uh, any kind of formal infrastructure that develops. Um, people who are working on urban health, one of the questions is what is it? It's so general, how would you engage on the topic? And these are the characteristics that most experts agree are somewhat unique to the urban environment, uh, the size and scale, uh, the density of people, the, co the diversity of individuals that are there, and then the complexity of the systems um, that have to support them. And um, these are the issues that are dealt with, again, through this intersectoral approach. Um, this is a little bit on the growth um, in uh, over the next 20 years or so of uh, the number of people living in cities. Um, this shows you the, ur the urban rural population um, uh, activity and the urban representation sort of crosses over um, the rural, um, actually did this past year, and the growth of cities um, is actually um, higher in, um, in many uh, low-income countries. The especially growth is in, um, is in uh, smaller cities, less than 500,000, not in the huge megacities, which are the image that we have, so it creates a, perhaps a more manageable challenge in some instances. And um, cities are not either good or bad. I mean, down the side are size, density, diversity, and complexity. And obviously, the positive and negative, I'll just use the question of density. I mean, density can make it easier to deliver services because you can plop a clinic down and take care of a lot more people in a city. Or if there's too much overcrowding, then it really becomes dysfunctional from a health point of view. The infrastructure is tacked, et cetera. So people are beginning to kind of parse out these areas and. Um, find their way toward um, a, um, an urban policy. Um, now, uh, 2010 was World Health Day um, on urbanization and health, and um, these are the sort of five points that came out of um, a report that was issued with WHO working with um, Habitat um, of the UN system. And the real message is we've got to recognize that in most countries, most people live in cities already, and very few countries have an urban policy. The United States does not have one. I remember in the Clinton administration, there was an effort to draft one, and it was really political. I mean, it's very politicized in the sense that cities are kind of left, and non-cities are not left, and that political dimension is quite present in many other countries. So um, it's a, an interesting question, is how do you position this in an interesting way, and also um, the, the challenge of this participatory urban governance. Many people in the smaller cities and uh, large cities are developing models where citizens can tell you what needs to happen. Um, and then on to aging. Um, the world is aging. Uh, global populations are um, up very dramatically, and um, we, uh, this again is an area where low-income countries are aging faster. Um, the rate is now increasing faster than high-income countries, and they're doing it before they have the wealth to cope with um, these increases, and this demographic pattern is going to have a profound effect um, on uh, a number of health policies. Obviously, it already does on uh, the cost of the healthcare system, which is where most of the policy focus is now. But um, there are also issues of sustainability of social insurance systems, economic productivity, and um, ways in which we provide social supports to older persons. But again, a paradigm shift is, uh, is underway, and um, this is like, quite, quite well demonstrated by the World Health Organization's Age-Friendly Cities Initiative. New York is one of the growing group of age-friendly cities around the world. Um, we at NIAM have been running this program with the mayor and the speaker for the last three years. And what this model does here is to say that 
Um, there's something called a life course approach to aging that um, the kinds of insults and illnesses and problems that people have, the environments that may damage them, the impact really starts um, in utero. It often starts with the mothers before they become pregnant, the young women, the nutrition levels and others of the young women. And then um, the idea is how do you reduce, by prevention, we've talked about, um, these insults so that you can maintain the highest level of function as far into older age as you can. And so at some point, um, the sort of medical realities are set and you need to start working on the environment. And that's really what Age-Friendly Cities tries to do. Um, and these are the domains of the age-friendly city. You'll see that health and social services is actually a very small dimension. The purpose of this is to deal with broader environmental issues in which older people um, live and, uh, and work and enjoy themselves. The driving uh, pattern on age-friendly is that older people themselves uh, tell you what the issues are in their community, what makes it easy, what makes it hard for them to live there. This is a global pattern and that information is used to inform the policy interventions. This is the um, work that was done in New York. Um, we launched this program uh, three years ago with the mayor, the speaker, and um, the uh, New York Academy. And you might ask yourself, why would a politician care about this? Because I always think about that because it's policy, right? So here's some data. Growth of New York City 65 and over population. In 2020, there will be more people over 65 in New York than there will be school children. This is a wake up call for anyone who's planning um, services as well as, as um, potential environmental changes, other ways of addressing the problem. The characteristics of these populations, this will be one of the most diverse older populations in the, world, in the United States. 100% um, increases, not big numbers, but in Asian Pacific Islanders, nearly 50% increases in black and Hispanic population. So again, the degree to which we have culturally competent services and others is um, a huge challenge. Um, the, um, and then we use GIS, Ge Geographic Information Systems, to demonstrate to city council people where seniors live in their councilmanic districts. So, if you're red, you ought to be paying attention to what's happening to older people because they're your voters. And this map probably had more to do with the engagement of the city council um, in some of the hearings and some of the engagement that you saw than, than anything else. And I think uh, the data that was gathered resulted in this uh, findings report. Um, we gave this to the city. Um, Mayor Gibbs, Deputy Mayor Gibbs, with the mayor's permission, convened 22 agencies across government to develop, um, to look at what they do um, and how it could be more age friendly. Now, having been in government, I had the same reaction they did when we were asked to present to the with the deputy mayor is um, we don't do aging, right? That's the that's DIFTA, we have an agency that does aging in New York. Um, we do parks, we do police, we do education. Um, and the second one is they want my money. So once they were um, relieved of both of those worries, um, that we were really looking for them to examine what they're already doing or planning to do and how they might do it differently. Because we know there's no money. This, uh, the announcement of this initiative happened on the day that Lehman Brothers failed. So um, it was a very clear message, although the mayor did show up for the press conference. But anyway. Um, so they then generated a report of 59 uh, recommendations, and we have something called, a, uh, these are the principles, which really is top down, bottom up. Uh, most of the changes are lower, no cost, and you need to keep moving and get early wins and sort of build uh, the momentum. And we had a meeting of the Age Friendly Commission this morning here um, at NIAM, and it's just almost become viral. I mean, the opportunities, uh, we, we're doing age-friendly businesses, age-friendly neighborhoods, um, schools, universities, and colleges, age-friendly uh, professions, um, what's an age-friendly, what are the characteristics of an age-friendly lawyer, um, an age-friendly librarian. Um, these are all things that are being developed and a new uh, work with a group of older persons on, uh, on aging, on t technology. Um, and again, it's an, an, this intersectoral health and all approach um, focused really on aging. So um, there's a lot of unfinished business uh, in the traditional global health agenda of infectious diseases and women's and children's health, and I do not intend to deflect um, 
the need to continue investing there. Uh, and we know there are limited uh, funds for new investments. And ODA, certainly in the United States, is pretty much already committed um, to this agenda of um, the MDGs. Some countries, UK, Nordic countries, are actually shifting a little bit more to focus on non-communicable diseases. And I think countries in the Pacific Basin, like Japan and Singapore, that are facing huge explosions of older persons are, in fact, um, taking more of a national approach to this. Um, the first annual age-friendly cities meeting just occurred in Dublin last week, and there were 400 individuals from 40 countries, and Deputy Mayor Gibbs uh, signed uh, the Dublin Declaration committing uh, New York City to action in this area. Um, by contrast, um, there is a group called the International Society for Urban Health, which, of which we are the Secretariat, just met in Brazil last week. Um, there were representatives from about 50 countries, governments, NGOs, academy, business, um, and the Pan American Health Organization launched its urban health agenda for the region of the Americas, but I think it's fair to say very few countries have an urban policy and really no internet, because it's a cross-agency issue, very few international agencies are really taking it on. Um, so progress in all of these um, agendas will require this intersectoral approach that I've tried to outline. Um, I think the, the heads of state um, that are sort of on the line in the recent high-level meeting have two years to try to deliver on this agenda, and there's going to be a lot of work to help them do that. Um, World Bank and regional development banks should be approached to consider the health impact of these large infrastructure um, and economic development projects that are in the pipeline or in the planning stages. And some initial conversations have people have been pretty receptive um, to health impact and to um, the aging lens. And the question of could the bank, should the bank, really begin to help countries uh, develop an urban policy or think about what that looks like. Um, there are other significant opportunities at the global level coming up. Rio Plus 20 meeting in June to measure progress on social and environmental development. What are the next steps? Could urban be in? Could aging be in? Could um, NCD, uh, the sort of environmental notions of the MCD agenda be there. Um, the revision of MDGs in 2015, preparation for that will probably start next year and try to integrate these issues there. Um, and finally, I think one of the hardest shifts is going to be the vision and understanding of donors because this is really critical. Um, much of the development paradigm to date is a rural one dealing with vertical programs. Um, and shifting into a focus on urban or long-term capacity building is very complicated. I've actually been at review sessions for grants where the reviewers just kind of walked away from urban proposals and said, this is too complicated. These people must not know what they're doing. Well, in fact, they did know what they're doing, which is why it was complicated. But it's kind of beginning to introduce this paradigm. So this shift is going to be an important one, but I think um, these are not agenda items owned by the health sector um, and cannot be adequately addressed by the personal health care delivery system alone. And the development of a more balanced portfolio of global health investments and uh, domestic health investments is both a challenge um, and I believe the opportunity for achieving significant improvements in global health. Thank you.